Hello everybody. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Michael Trazi. Michael is the host of the YouTube channel, The Inside View, the second best podcast on AI alignment. Yeah, so I'm here with uh, Daniel, we're in Berkeley, and the goal here is to make the same episode as a chicken, as a hot wings episode, but instead of eating hot wings, we're going to like, climb the entire Berkeley Hills and film at the same time. And we'll see um, how Daniel feels after uh, each like miles of climbing. We're now at zero miles, and how are you feeling, Daniel? Feeling all right. Uh, feeling confident about the road ahead. I, and think I, I think I've done this like maybe more than you have. So yeah, maybe maybe I will ask you like how doomy you are about the future <laughs> every Let's mile. See how it changes. All right. <laughs> how 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 doomy are you right now? Um. Uh, I guess I guess relatively doomy, but not like. Not quite Yudkowsky tier right now. Right, I, th I think I think we need to climb a little bit more to to, to get more doomy. All right. Um, any any other um, thoughts on the on the climb before we do it? Um, uh, not especially. I guess the one thing I want to have on camera is uh, Berkeley's clock tower is taller than Stanford's, so take that, Stanford people. <laughs> okay, take it away. Here I am with Daniel, and we just walked uh, around 10 minutes uphill. Yeah. We had to catch our breath for uh, about two minutes, but now I can finally ask questions to Daniel. And as you can see, we're, you can see San Francisco, the entire bay. And Daniel used to be a guide for Berkeley, so he can tell us some stuff. Uh, yeah, well we're, well, we're off campus now, but uh, what can I tell you about Berkeley? It's better than Stanford. Uh, that's like the most important thing you should know. <laughs> um, we also, I don't know, it's got like cool buildings. It's got uh, some history. Actually, so, okay, it used to be the case that if you were on the West Coast, and you were plugged into the ARPANET, the earlier, earliest version of the internet, and you wanted to like get some data that was stored on a computer in the East Coast, it used to be that that package, that, like, package, that request, would route through a server that was like on the UC Berkeley campus. So that's pretty cool. Um, also, if you know the text editor Vim, it's an iteration on the text editor Vi. Vi was programmed in like a UC Berkeley building. Um, and Vi was programmed in C, right? Uh, I I we made C as well, we're from Berkeley, but I'm not sure. That might be your, uh, I, I only learned a limited number of facts. <laughs> I have to admit, this is this is where my expertise in, on Vi ends. In, in terms of like limited number of facts, uh, one fact about you is that you are large language models vegan. That's right, yeah. What does LLM vegan mean and why you're a vegan? <laughs> um, yeah, LLM veganism, I like don't use uh, GPT, like chat GPT or GPT-4 stuff. It's not like a super thought out stance, to be honest, but like the rough instinct is, I don't know, I'm kind of worried that like AI is gonna, you know, get out of control, take over Earth, kill everyone. And I'm not that keen on like paying for products that are part of this, you know, movement towards omnicidal AGI. So I don't actually know if it makes sense. I don't like advocate for LLM veganism, but uh, that's a fact about me. Okay, uh, this, was, this was Daniel after uh, 10 minutes of, of walking. We'll see you uh, at the top or in between. Uh, and then. Okay, so Daniel, now we've uh, just hiked for uh, about 20 minutes. I guess, I'm, I'm uh, not really sure. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Uh, it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of steps so far. Um, so I don't know, just like getting that, getting that quad work in. Um, what's your current probability of, of extinction from AI in the, in the next century? Human extinction in the yeah. next century? No humans alive. No humans alive. Uh, like 40%-ish. 40%? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but higher for generalized doom, you know. Right, so what about generalized doom? Oh, like, uh, I don't know, 70-ish percent. And do you count as doom the same scenarios that Paul Christian described in My Views on Doom? Is like it's been, a, it's been a while since I read so that I think, one. I think, I think he just like talks about futures where, so 10 years after we build peripheral AIs, mm. um, we could get in situations where the future is irreversibly messed up. Mm. So we, we can go back to futures like with crazy utopias or a lot of value. Yeah. Or just like most humans die. Yeah. So he doesn't talk about extinction, but like most humans dying. Yeah. And I think, I think if, if you like add, the, add these up, um, you, you get to like 40, 46%. Um, um, so is, is this basically the same as your 70%? Uh, yeah, that sound. or most humans die, I, I, assume, I assume you mean most, most humans killed by AI rather than just dying of natural causes or something? I think, I think people could die from like 
you know, AI, AI be, being like very powerful and people using AI to do other things, like maybe like hacking to like nuclear plants. Sure, friends. sure. Um, but you're not counting like, oh, uh, we like didn't solve medicine as fast as we could. No, no, it's like most, most humans are dead. Most humans are dead. It's not like they, they, most they, they can't. Most humans are dead today, right? <laughs> I think that's true. Um, <laughs> Let's say, let's say, uh, from this eight billion that we are today, most most are dead, or uh, the population is like very close to zero, <laughs> whatever. Okay, the overall population <laughs> is close to zero. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if if we're not in a position to recover, then yeah, I would count that as doom. If if like if most of the population dies and we can bounce back, <laughs> there's two, that's pretty awful. But, but there's like, two it's people and bad. they're very smart. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, <laughs> they never, have never count the ingenuity, never underestimate the ingenuity of two determined people. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, that would really suck. To be clear, I'm not, I'm not pro that. <laughs> um, tomorrow on Twitter, Daniel Phelan, pro everyone dying. Um, so we, so we, we've managed to like walk quite a lot, and um, now, uh, as you can see in the view, um, we're in between Oakland, Berkeley, and there's SF in the back still. But nobody knows who Daniel Phelan is yet. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can. International like, mat of mystery. A, a better, better lighting. Okay. Um, who, who is Daniel Phelan? Who's the person behind the mask? Oh, uh, I guess that's a big question. Uh, I'm. So right now I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, um, working at Center for Human Compatible AI. Um, I think people are maybe most likely to know me as the host of the AI X Risk Research Podcast or AXRP. I'm kind of curious about um, the story of, of, of Daniel Thailand. How did how did you end up like caring about AI X Risk uh, research? And uh, yeah. So I know I know we're we're traveling right now. We're like the beautiful trees on the left, and you're telling me that those trees are from Australia. Yeah, they're they're not native to here. They're called eucalyptus trees. In Australia, we call them gum trees. And yeah, they're like, I don't know, they make me feel sort of at home because they're what I'm used to, but... um. And you're also not completely native. I think you're American, but you're also grew up in Australia. Yeah, I, I was born and raised in Australia, but my mom is American. So I've like, I have a US citizenship and I have a relatively American accent. And yeah, what what led you in Australia to be like, oh damn, I need to go to Berkeley and and solve this AI thing and make this book. <laughs> yeah, I it started when I like went to university. Um, so yeah, I, I went to this university um, in a different city from where I grew up. So I was like staying in a dorm, and I met at the dorm. I met this guy called Buck Slugaris, um, who is now the head of Redwood Research, um, like which people might be familiar with. But yeah, I don't know. He like got me into less wrong and AI doom, and then I was like, "Well, I don't know. It seems like it's just math. I'm interested in math. Maybe I can like have a crack at it." Uh, so, so that's so what were, got me interested. So you were interested in the beauty of the math, like I I, I know in Australia there's Marcus Hatter that like has his yeah um, yeah, and I worked in his research group. Yeah, he he invented a AXI, right? I see. Yeah. Do you wanna give a one tweet version of AXI? <laughs> Ixe is, suppose you are a Bayesian and you have this very broad prior over like any computer program that could be like generating the world outside of you. And you're trying to pick actions that maximize expected reward where the expectation is over like all the programs that are like compatible with what you've seen, uh, weighted by your prior. That's Ixe. And so now you're like at the Center for Human Compatible AI. That's right. And uh, yeah, can you just like give like a few words on what the Center for Human Compatible AI or Chai is doing? Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Chai is um, it's it's sort of a loose group of graduate students. I think our mission statement is like doing developing the technical wherewithal to develop provably beneficial AI. Um, so I don't know, there's a few different people like we have, like there's this research strand based on cooperative inverse reinforcement learning. There's, there's a lot of people working on like human AI collaboration and like having AI like infer what humans want and try to be helpful. There's some work on like trying to understand the foundations of AI better, like maybe do things a bit different from reinforcement learning. There's some work on like adversarial attacks. Um, so like if you've seen that adversarial attack on Go paper, um, that was the, the lead, one of the primary researchers of that was like 
at Chai when a bunch of the work was being done. And yeah, Go, Go is interesting because uh, yeah. that's somehow how I really met you uh, in, oh, yeah. in Prague in 2018. I remember the first day, uh, there was like an AI alignment conference in Prague. Yeah, yeah. And um, we sit in a bar and there was a Go board and we were the only two people who were like decent at Go. And I think at the beginning I was winning by a decent margin, if I okay. remember correctly. But then you caught up and it was very, very tight. Um, huh. So that's how I really, really met the Daniel final, Phylon. Phylon. <laughs> Daniel fi Um I, I got into AI alignment because I was interested in Go and I was playing Go uh, against professionals that thought that um, AI was very, very far. They were making jokes of, of, of AIs losing, of AIs winning uh, with four handicaps mm. against professionals. And uh, two years after, uh, pro professional, professionals were uh, losing with like no handicap at all. Um, so yeah, were you like playing Go at that time? Were you like impressed by AlphaGo? Yeah, I was um, back back in high. I think I started playing Go in high school. I don't exactly remember. I, I, yeah, I don't remember when. I remember. I think I was just like reading stuff on Wikipedia and like somehow came across Go and decided to play. But um, yeah, I was AlphaGo was pretty impressive. Um, I don't know. I like. I think it's sort of a normie take, but um, I don't know. It's it's like a really hard problem, and and they they kind of. I mean, the interesting thing is they almost knocked it out of the park, right? Like I would have, I think before that match had started, I would have guessed that, like either the human is going to win all of the games or the AI is going to win all the games, but in fact neither of those happened, right? So that that was kind of exciting, and yeah, just seeing the development of computer go. Like on one hand, we've learned from it, but on the other hand, it just like it feels so much better than us like it feels like it's it's learned things that humans haven't learned it like like sometimes people say that like ai isn't creative and like i don't know man it invented new go openings i don't know what creative is <laughs> if it's not that so it also like took some go openings that people thought were bad and people like started realizing it was like actually good and balance one opening is when you start on the three three point the sun sun and you invade a corner. Yeah, um, early invasion of 3-3, yeah. Nobody nobody was doing this before, and now people are just like, do it all the fucking time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really weird, because that's like, yeah, people it's interesting. teach you as a, as a beginner to never do this, never invade on a 3-3 point. At least early on, yeah. And and nobody nobody uh, was doing it in tournaments, and now everybody's doing it. Like, professionals keep doing it all the time. Yeah, yeah. It just... <laughs> Just blew away our uh, preconceptions. So, I don't know. Uh, so if, if if I was like someone watching the video from Twitter, I would be like, I don't know, I don't know, man. Go is just a game. Um, it seems like it seems like language and like doing like economic stuff right now is more important. Um, so did, did you think Go was actually a milestone or just like uh, it seemed like impressive at the time because nothing was happening in the AI? That's a good question. Um, what do I think about that? I think that. It's certainly true that, like, if you look at what um, how L large language models currently work, they they have a bit in common with AlphaGo, but like not not that much. So, on the one hand, they're both neural networks. <laughs> they're both yeah, they're both neural networks <laughs> of some kind. Uh, You're also a neural network. <laughs> I'm well of of a somewhat different kind. Um, yeah, like maybe I think the biggest milestone is just showing that like you can fit interesting knowledge inside a neural network. Like, I don't think that was so obvious to people. Like, I don't... Yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to, like, think about what the state of the field was back then, but I think that, like, you might have been skeptical that, like, neural networks even had it in them to do interesting planning or stuff. To, to fit in, like, the, the kinds of computations that we really care about, but, like... That turns out they could fit that inside them. So I guess, like, maybe that's what we learned from AlphaGo. Around 2016, 2017, everyone was really interested in, like, AGI is, like, doing RL really well, right? Right, right, right? Like, Like, you saw AlphaGo, and you were like, oh, wow, what if we did AlphaGo, but, like, way, way harder? And, like, I don't know. I, I, I guess, like, yeah, as the per like, back when that was, like, the main impressive thing you had with AI, made, this was, like, kind of understandable. I think, like, now we have LLMs, right? And like they're even more impressive than Go, or they're even more impressive than the best RL agents. And I think like I think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I guess AGI is going to be like LLMs, but like a little bit better. 
And it does make me think, like, I wonder if there's just some bias where we can't see, like, the next cool thing. Like, LLMs do a little bit build off of... Like, if you think about AlphaGo, right? It was, like, imitation learning, and then it was some RL. And there is some sense in which LLMs are, in fact, imitation learning plus a little bit of RL. But like, they also look importantly different, right? And I do wonder, like, like when we think about, like, what AGI is going to look like, maybe it's going to be as different from current LLMs as, like, current LLMs are from AlphaGo. I think. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm an LLM vegan, so I don't have first-hand experience. That's <laughs> so funny. Okay, so uh, this was Daniel Phelan after 20 minutes of walking. We'll see you back in uh, 20 minutes. All right, you should do it. Um, so now we've uh, come to almost the top of uh, Berkeley slash Oakland. And uh, how, are, how are you feeling right now? Feeling good. Uh, I don't know. It's always nice to... Somehow I feel like more love for humanity at this. You know, you, you like you see the city and you're like, oh man, humans, they're so great. So and that's how I feel. So do, do you, would you feel like, would you say you're like optimistic about the future and like human, like com comparing with AI? I think I'm more optimistic about the present. I don't know if I'm more optimistic about the future, I'm afraid. Um, so w one thing you're doing at the moment is uh, you're the host of uh, the AI X Risk podcast. AI Research TV, podcast. AI X X risk research podcast. That's why it's a bad name. Um, what do you um, What do you do in this podcast? What do you ask? What do you? Uh... Yeah, basically, I have I have on guests who have like thought a lot about AI existential risk and like have done research. I don't know relating to that. Um, and yeah, I basically try to ask them. Firstly, like why they do the research that they do, like why they think it's important, what they're aiming for, in a sense. Um, and I also just talk about, like, the details of their work and, like, I don't know, how their thing works and why they did this thing rather than this other thing. And, and I, I try to get a little bit into the weeds. Yeah, I'm curious, like, um, when did you, like, actually, like, start this, this endeavor? Like, did you, um, um, did you, did you start it when you started doing your PhD? Uh, was it, like, more recent? Was it, was it like, a, a turning point where you're like, oh, I'm going to be the host of a podcast right now? There actually was. So, um, at the start of... So in when when COVID hit, I think around March, I like ordered a bunch of like I, I ordered a nice microphone and a nice camera because I thought I'd be on web calls all the time. And then I, I get this microphone, and it says podcasting microphone, and I'm like, oh, what if what if the world heard my voice? You know, <laughs> it, it was a bit egotistical. And also at the time, I was listening to this podcast. It's called the Age of Jackson podcast, and it's by this Australian who's doing a PhD in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, who is like interviews like researchers in his field of expertise and asks them questions about the, their research, and also his name is Daniel, and so I thought, well, what if I did that? You know? Did you have like any like goal into like what you want to achieve or like good you want to do in the world or yeah, I or think fun like, you want to have? <laughs> honestly, I think like I remember moving to the Bay Area in 2016, and there was this thing where like once you actually talk to people about their work, like it made a way more sense why they were doing what they were doing. So, like, the famous example of this was Miri. Like, in 2016, like, they, they'd they written, like, not that much up. Like, ev everyone was, like, kind of confused about, like, wait, why do they think all of this stuff is important? What's Miri if I'm, like, a random, like, YouTube Yeah, subscriber? Miri is the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. They're, uh, they're kind of, like, the OG, like, research org that was focused on experts from AI. Um, and... and, and uh... OG researcher was Elias Goski. Yeah, he's he started Mary, and they had a bunch of stuff on like weird decision theory and like uh, you know logical uncertainty, and everyone was like, wait, how does this? What does this have to do with AI not killing everyone? And like, in order to know the answer to that question, you just had to talk to people, right? And similarly, I feel like if somebody's an academic researcher, right? Uh, especially, you know, this is a bit less true now, but like, you publish a paper. In like a main, in like one of the main conferences, you have eight pap you have eight pages, right? That that's all that's all the space you have in your paper for your main content. Um, if you include like anything about like why your work is relevant to X risk, it like by and large it doesn't help your paper get accepted, and you're using up precious space that could be used for other things, right? So like, yeah, I just felt like there was a bunch of like like why people were doing the work that they were doing, like what the point of it was. I feel like a lot of that was hard to get just from the text, just from what people had written on the internet. And so, I don't know, conversations, they're great. So I thought, why not record them? <laughs> um, and so and so you would read like this like archive paper and 
uh, you would like not really understand if people were like motivated by safety or not, and then you would talk to them and you, you would like understand that they really were motivated by uh, making models safe, but they couldn't really like put them in papers. Yeah, or not just that they were motivated by safety, but like how like what was the link between this thing that they were doing and like AI not you know taking over the world? Like sometimes it's not so obvious, right? So like yeah, like like I remember I had this episode with Jeffrey Irving where like I don't know he he had all these papers and like. I, like, previously he'd worked on AI safety via debate, and I remember thinking, like, uh, like, why has he stopped that, you know? What, like, what, like, why is he doing all this random stuff instead? And then, like, I talked to him on the podcast, and he's like, yeah, all of these are things you need to get AI safety via debate working, you know? So, yeah, trying trying to understand, like, why these things were, like, like some sort of world model where, like, these things were relevant to, to AI alignment, so that you could listen to the episodes, and you could be like, oh... I totally buy this. Maybe I should work on this. Or, oh, this makes less sense than I would have thought. Like, maybe I don't want to work on this. You know, it's ba basically, like, I don't know. I, I have this dream that, like, when people are, like, entering the field of AI alignment, they listen to some of my interviews, and then they're that causes them to make better decisions about what to work on. That's, like, the hope. So they, they, they learn about AI safety or AI alignment research, and they uh, watch your podcast, and they're like, listen. whoa. <laughs> listen. I, I, I haven't figured out cameras yet. You're, you're far ahead of me. They, they listen to one of your podcasts and then they're like, this is a very exciting problem or like, now I understand why this guy did it and I, I, I kind of have the same like motivation than him. Yeah, or like, oh, they, like you, this guy thinks you need these three things to solve alignment and these two are being worked on but this one isn't. Like, yeah, just, just a the, better feel of the lay of the land, you know? The three hot things you need to build align AI. Yeah. <laughs> the third one will impress you. <laughs> if I'm if I'm someone uh, that usually watches uh, the inside view, yeah, uh, and sometimes the AI alignment research episodes, uh, what's a good pitch for like the difference or like, um, let's say the the things are kind of similar as well? Yeah, I think that. Um, well, if you if you don't like video, uh, <laughs> you're gonna like Axerp. No, no, but like, um, you know, some people like but, uh, listen and don't watch the video. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, how's it gonna be different? Um, I think like, yeah, I, I guess like, I try to. So when I go, I go longer. Like I think, I think I have like quite a few three hour or two hour plus interviews. I don't know if you have that many. Um, yeah, I try to like. Uh, I I think maybe I go a bit more in the weeds than you do. Um, so do you do you like ask technical questions about uh, about their research? Do you try to like I will uh, ch yeah. challenge them on on some technical stuff? I don't know if I'll try to challenge them. I don't know. Like my my philosophy of interviewing is very much like I'm gonna like I, I think the point of an interview for me is to just like try and understand what's inside a person's mind, right? So I might be like, hey, you think this. <laughs> somebody's raised this objection but you still believe it so like why do you still believe it you know so it's it's like a bit like a challenge but it's not anyway so so yeah i i mean i will ask like hey why'd you formulate this in this way rather than this other way sometimes maybe less of that recently so, so, yeah. so like, you're interested in in like why why did someone um uh, ask um sorry uh work on this problem on this paper or yeah uh, what, what did they start doing this kind of research? Why do you think this research is, is, is important for the world? A lot of that. Also, also, sometimes there are, like, things related to their research that won't be in their paper. So, like, yeah, like, like I remember um, the work on induction heads. So th this was this, like, work at Anthropic about these, like, this type of structure that emerges in language models, um, allegedly. And, like, they kind of show that it happens in a phase transition. And they show this, like, principal component analysis of, like, activations or something where, like, as, as training evolves, it starts here and then it goes down and then ticks up. And like, I remember asking like, "Hey, what are the, what are the principal components? What what do those represent? You know?" So like, I don't know details of things that like didn't quite make it into the paper. Sometimes I'll ask about. So that was uh, Daniel Fallon after uh, half an hour of walking uphill. We've now reached the end of the of the hike. Um, how do you feel? Feeling good. Uh, yeah, nice to nice to get some exercise in. Nice to. Uh, you know, have this really nice view. Yeah. Um, so, when you woke up this morning, um, how were you feeling about AI? <laughs> how was I feeling about AI this morning? Um, like, more generally, like, when you wake up in the morning, where do you see AI going in the next five years? Yeah, I guess... You, I, you, you, you said you had 10-year timeline, so... What or 10-ish, I don't know. I don't know so, really. So, what, what, what do we have in 10 years? Like, GPT-9 uh, GPT and... Um, 
that does like a lot of like economic stuff. Yeah, but, but still not quite self improving AI. Yeah, I think like like if you look at GPT four or something, like it seems like it's able to do like a bunch of tasks, but somehow like like it feels like it's not quite able to make useful plans that like achieve valuable stuff in the real world on hard mode. So like yeah, maybe maybe I see like a bunch of common sense and a bunch of like you know it, it can kind of do a bunch of like useful video editing you know it can make your transcripts it can like <laughs> do your taxes but like maybe it's not quite ready to be ceo um and that's that's my rough guess is, is 10 years like a number that comes from somewhere or is it just like your vague feeling um some combination of my vague feeling and like I think at some point I looked at like various reports and tried to adjust them. I, I, 10 years might be a little bit low. I might I might be like more like 15. Last interview I did was with Jesse Hoogland and we talked about singular learning theory. Oh yeah. Uh, and I heard you're also into this kind of thing. Yeah, I'm pilled. I'm singular learning theory pilled. Uh, uh, yeah, since, since when have you been uh, singular learning theory pilled? Honestly, I... And, and for people who have not watched the episode, like can you like summarize what singular learning theory is? Yeah, okay. So singular learning theory is roughly it's a theory of Bayesian learning for parameterized model classes like neural networks, where instead of having like one optimum point, you've got like a whole, you've got a set of points that all have optimum loss. And maybe you've got like this line of points with optimum loss and this line of points with optimum loss and they like cross somewhere. Single learning theory basically says that like these places where your sets of points of optimum loss cross are really interesting and like determine the dynamics of like how learning happens. Um, so yeah, I think like, I actually did an interview with Quentin Pope on my podcast where like he thought singular learning theory was really important. Um, I, I'd met Jesse at an EA Global event. Um, and yeah, I, I saw there, there was announced that there was going to be this like lecture series on singular learning theory. And I thought like, uh, yeah, it might be fun to like spend the mornings at that, you know, I spend the afternoons doing my PhD and it was just really engaging. Like it's... I don't know, it's, it's like, it, it's like legit math, which I like. Um, it's very like, yeah, it's this theory of neural networks where like, like one cool thing about it is like the structure of the singularity, like, like the structure of the, this place where these lines of sort of minimum loss cross, the, it sort of means that your effective number of, your effective parameter counts is like lower than the actual number of parameters in your neural networks. And what this means is that, like, there's this question of, like, why do neural networks actually learn something like a good representation? Why don't they just overfit? Because they have, have enough parameters that they could overfit. And the answer is, like, for the right type of data, you have the right type of singularities where the neural network acts as if it doesn't have that many parameters and it doesn't overfit. And then you also have this theory of phase transitions where, like, you know, first it's a, this type of singularity, and, like, then as you get more data, you go to this different kind of singularity, then as you get more data, you, get, you go to this different kind of singularity. And, like... It feels like, I don't know, it just feels like it's it's this rigorous theory that makes sense of, like, some of the confusing things about deep learning. So, yeah, that's, may, maybe that conveys what excites me about it. Do you think that we have a good shot of, um, like, getting a better understanding of how neural networks think or, like, uh, solving, like, interpretability as a whole with, with singular uh, learning theory? I don't know about solving interpretability as a whole. I, oh. think there, I think there's, like, a good shot that it, like, helps make some headway. Um, yeah, and, but it's a bit hard to say. So, and yeah, uh, I, I think you're also like quite excited about interpretability or like mechanistic interpretability as a whole. Yeah, way. yeah. Yeah, can you just like quickly like d define them? Define, and, oh, okay. Uh, just quickly like a sentence or two. Yeah, mechanistic interpretability is understanding the internals of neural networks, especially with reference to the mechanisms they implement. Like what kinds of computations are they doing inside the net? That's what mechan mechanistic interpretability or mechinterp for short is. And, um, yeah, why are you excited about it? Um, well, if I try and think of stories for why AI kills everyone, <laughs> I think somebody makes an AI, and then they don't know that it's going to kill everyone, and then it does. Like, that's, I think that's my mainline story for how it happens. So, if we had a better sense of, like, whether AI was going to kill everyone, then maybe we wouldn't build scary AI. And I, I have this hope that, like, if we understand... But like probably you're gonna test your AI a little bit in a test in you know some sort of sandbox and it won't kill everyone there, and if it does kill everyone, it's gonna be because it's like got some internal plans or something, 
and the more you can understand like the internals of your AI, then hopefully like uh, you can avoid this kind of situation. Yeah, I think the the main two counter arguments that came to my mind is um, one: would the AI itself know it's going to kill everyone before it does? Um, <laughs> somehow, maybe like it might not like want to kill everyone, but might do it in the in the way. And I think the, the the same argument would be like maybe like when it's like at a level where we can understand it, hmm. it, it won't have those like incentives or like the power to do it. But at the time, it's like able to like self improve. Uh, and like then much later after it's self improves, then it's going to be like able to kill everyone, not be deceptive. And so it, it, it won't like catch the those moments. Yeah, I think like Yeah, it's it's tricky because like you wanna you wanna be able to I I guess you wanna do it after it's finished self improving, or you wanna have a good enough theory of like how AI self improves so that like you know what has to be true for it to not self improve into like something that's gonna kill everyone. It's definitely not like a... I, I think mechanterp is not all you need. For one, neural nets are very big, so you're gonna have to figure out some way of automating it that doesn't, that isn't just like have your AI check if your AI is aligned. You know, <laughs> seems like a bad plan. What else do you need? Like, what else do you need? Um, you might need to understand like, like my my guess is that you probably need to understand what sorts of things make a network amenable to interpretation, and like maybe you need to regularize for those sorts of properties. Um. I, I don't know exactly what that is. Maybe it's modularity. Um, maybe it's something else. I don't exactly know. What, what makes a model interpretable, you said? Yeah, or, or, or what structural properties of a model make it easier to interpret? So, like, um, for, for example, like, uh, how do we stop... Like, how can you train neural networks so that they don't tend to form polysemanticity? Or, like, how can we, you know... Like, if neural networks are, like if they have all these features that are not represented by any single neuron, but by combinations of neurons, like, how can we, like, build models where it's obvious which directions are, like, the relevant sorts of features? And in this way, if, if, even if we don't build at first, like, some AIs that are, like, interpretable, then we could, like, just tell them to be, like, um, more yeah. interpretable or, like, build other ones that are, like, smaller and more... Yeah, or, or maybe, like, while you're training your AGI, you just regularize it so that it has these properties. Maybe, who knows? Regularize all the, all the AGIs and align them. Yeah, yeah, regularize for goodness. That's my. <laughs> and then, and I'm then, in favor. And then use them to do more alignment research. Uh, I guess. Um, yeah, I, th I think once you're AI, I can do AI alignment research. I'm not sure how many more alignment problems you have left, but uh, that, well, that could just be my ignorance. That's, that, that, that's the main agenda for OpenAI, right? Yeah. Build AI to do alignment research. Yeah. I don't totally get it, but. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, I'll understand better. Mm. Um, do you have any um, last last take um, to end possibly this this video or last takes to end the video? Um, or a message to people watching this, an advice from Daniel Filan. Advice from oh wow. Um, advice from Daniel Filan. Um, what, what, what advice would you give your younger self? To my younger self about AI. Oh, <laughs> that's, like, that's a hard question. That's a hard question. Uh, hey, AI okay, here's, here's my advice. Look, uh, if you're watching this video, it's possible that you're working in the field of AI, and it's possible that you're worried that like AI might like doom human civilization. Um, you don't have to work on AI. Like, you can probably get another job. It might not pay as well, but it'll probably pay pretty good. You, like, like if, uh, and I'm not saying this to everyone, but like if you think that AI is going to destroy humanity. Maybe, like, don't work on making it better. I think that's my advice. What, what kind of job would you advise them to take? What, what kind of, like, opportunity can you do? Can, can, can they go on? I don't know, like, uh, build... Uh, I, I hear software engineering has, like, a whole bunch of roles in it. Uh, so you Try you, those. So you become... Make Google Docs way better. F figure out how to, like, build tooling for bioengineering. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sure there are tons of jobs you could do. So, you, so, you, so you're not telling them to do like AI alignment research instead? Maybe you could do AI alignment research. That would be even better. But like, or, or, or like help help some like startup or like or that does alignment research too, but doing like more like engineering or software engineering there. Yeah, maybe. But like, uh, I think, I think just don't work on AI at all is somewhat underrated as a way. I feel to... I feel like that's like a tough a tough ask because like if you've worked a lot of hours in your career to become like an AI engineer or researcher and um, someone tells you like just not do AI yeah it's kind of like 
you kind of like nagging their entire life. I mean, uh, and I feel like you you might want to. That's why they need the advice. <laughs> if, it think, were, I, if it were I obvious, I wouldn't is, have to say it. I think the advice is more like um, alignment research right now is is currently um, pre paradigmatic, but is 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 slowly becoming more like mainstream AI research where we do like experiments and uh, you can publish papers. And so, if you're interested in in doing AI research, I feel like this is like one of the most uh, exciting fields you can work on, uh, because that's like um, what Elias Discover uh, calls uh, the new deep learning. Because uh, in 2012, 2015, deep learning was was uh, starting to grow, and we're starting to see, to see the same with alignment research. It's getting a lot of traction. It's gonna be a problem that like in a few years it's going to be like mainstream. Uh, so it's maybe like the the perfect time to like start working on this. Maybe. Um. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, maybe I do have a hot take, which is, I don't know that, <laughs> like, I don't know that we're doing that good a job in the alignment community. Like, I don't know, it's, it's a really hard job. I don't know, maybe we just, maybe if we had, like, way, way more people, we would be doing a better job, but it's really hard. And, uh, I don't know, maybe, like, just don't build AGI, or maybe, you know, stop building AGI for a while. Maybe that's just, like, the way to go. Just don't build AGI. Just don't build... Well, at some point, we should probably build AGI. I think, I, I think I'm more endorsed just stop building AGI. W just for the moment. When, when should we build AGI? When we know how... I, I think we should build AGI when... I mean, uh, who's we, right? But I think we should build AGI when we have a really good story for why we can make things that are way smarter than humans that won't kill everyone. Like once, you, like, once you have a really good story for, like, what the plan would be such that that doesn't happen, then then we can build AGI. And I don't know, maybe maybe you think we currently do have a plan. Um, I, I'm a bit more skeptical. I'm sad because I think there's, like, a very good, very good shot, but at the same time, I'm, like, out of questions. Well, enjoy the shot, viewers. <laughs> enjoy the shot. Yeah, that's the, the last shot of the video. Uh, if you want me to record a uh, podcast every day like this, uh, subscribe to the channel, subscribe on Patreon, subscribe to his podcast, xrp.net. And uh, yeah, let's see you uh, tomorrow for another video. <laughs>